Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to True House Stories this week. Again, we always get the best people in our music game. And this woman is an iconic figure. So I'm going to pull up her albums so you can see them. Okay. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and then we're going to bring her right up. Melba Moore is an American, prolific, five octave singer and award-winning actress mm -hmm. from Broadway, contemporary soul, R&B, pop, rock, jazz, mm -hmm. disco music for those disco music fans, gospel, house music, and classical. Melba was destined to be a superstar. It could have been her Grammy-nominated cover of the Aretha Franklin classic Lean On Me or her Tony Award winning performance as Ludie Bell, Gussie Mae Jenkins, and Pearly that solidified her place in American hearts. And when she became the first African American woman to perform the role of Fantine in Les Miserables, music is what God allows me to do, declares Melba. Born into a musical family, music found Melba. Music was a centerpiece in her family. Her parents were musicians, and so many of her aunts and uncles. Melba's father is a legendary big band leader, Teddy Hill, and her mother, Bonnie Davis, had a number one hit on the R&B charts with the song Don't Stop Now. A graduate of the famed Arts High in Newark, Melba, at the encouragement of her parents, went on to pursue music education at Montclair State, but her inner voice told her she had to see if she had the chops to make it as a performer. Melba's stepfather, pianist Clement Mormon, introduced several agents which led her to some studio work and eventually an audition that landed her a role in the cult classic Hair on Broadway in 1969. And it was in Hair that Melba became the first African-American woman to replace a white actress who happened to be the acclaimed Diane Keaton in a leading role on Broadway. And those that don't remember Diane Keaton, she's doing movies now, but she was in The Godfather. So that was a massive, massive thing. Melba was also one of the first black women to win a Tony Award. And of course, her fame as a powerhouse singer and actor segued her into having a very amazing music career. We like to welcome to the stage the iconic Melba Moore to True House Stories. And thank you so much for coming on the show. And she is fresh as ever <laughs> after coming back from the United Kingdom. I know wish how she performed those damn things. It's amazing. God bless you. And, <laughs> and here's the thing, girl. I genuflect to you because you are stage, screen, music, Grammys, Tony Awards. God bless you. And still everlasting today to keep going. That's a testament to everything. You know what I'm saying? Because we know the story. We heard you say it. And, but it's not easy when you're in the pit of it. You know, you, you get the fame and fortune and then possibly... Hard knocks fall, things do happen, and then to rise like True. a phoenix. True. Ah, oh, yes. And thank you for the accolades. I receive them, and they're true. It's not easy, but thank you. I, I really uh, enjoy being here with you already. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, also I'm in this music industry, too. I'm a record producer, yeah. DJ, um, yeah. and I followed you as a, as a kid through the disco era, I mean, and watching you on your show, your TV show and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, that was groundbreaking back then, you know. Um, since there's so many disco fans, because I, I was actually at a part, like a gathering last night, and they were asking, hey, you have a Melba Moore? I'm like, oh, yeah. Of course, they asked me first question, always, is she going to talk about, it, about this is it? I said, I'll see, I'll ask her. Absolutely. Are you joking? Yes. <laughs> Please. Well, so I just came back from London. And, uh, <clears throat> that's really where Van McCoy kind of helped to plant disco into the world. He did it from Europe first. But Van McCoy wrote This Is It. And he wrote The Disco Hustle. You know that though, right? You know, it's a long, 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 long time ago, but that's what started it all. So, uh, fortunately, back in UK, they never forget nothing, good or bad. <laughs> so I had to sing that song all week. Oh, you did sing it? Oh man! Oh, this time I know it's the real thing. See, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. You've been well. You know when they say "born ready," <laughs> girl, you came out ready, ready, like beyond ready. Yeah. I want you to know that I appreciate what my life is, that I didn't do it by myself, 
that you guys, you DJs, you, you are new bosses. You're the new promoters and producers. You keep the thing going. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I spoke to John Luongo this week. I, oh, uh, yes. And John, as everybody knows, like Tom Moulton, I'm friends with as yep. well. Tom, yep. it's, this is it. And, you know, and John yep. Mix, you stepped into my life. Those are like, for us, iconic. They are. I mean, I'm telling you who wrote it, but who mixed it is everything. That's like the arrangement. That's the, 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 um, the version of it that you heard that was a hit. Right. We heard and played. Yeah. Over and over, over and 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 over now, in all the clubs everywhere. And then, of course, on radio. Now, here's the thing now. Some people, you know, do this thumb their nose at dance music. This is a time where in the early 70s, R&B is breaking through and the FM radio broke through because we had Frankie Crocker in New York. Woo-hoo! The Frank Hollywood Crocker. Crocker. Frankie Crocker! Hollywood Woo! Rocker. Your radio ain't on unless Crocker's on, baby, right? That's FM radio. That's a new thing. Right. I mean, <laughs> At that time, because nobody understands that. I can, oh, these kids, have they, they just stream now. But back then, you, you had yeah, yeah. four channels, five channels. You remember on, on how? You, you only know, had a few, but it was also the beginning. Before FM, there was no such thing as FM. Right. At least not for black people, it wasn't. That's right. Eddie Parker was it. We was on the map then. We had a real radio station, FM station, and real programmers. It really existed. It was a real system. So it was the beginning of an official era. And you're right there, groundbreaking times. I mean, you're right in the in the whole Mecca, as we say. Yeah. You know, like All when they say, Lewis, but just let me be in the mix. Ow! The mix. <laughs> right. <laughs> but now we're talking now, you're still in 69, 1969, 1970, yeah. FM radio begins. So you're in stage and screen doing your thing. Yeah. How yeah. Does the, I know I saw an interview. You mentioned you did backgrounds in the Brill Building for Sinatra, some of the hottest people yeah. the, of, of pop. Yeah, that was Valerie Simpson's fault. She hired me. <laughs> Say she's the, a smart one. She's smart. Okay, so what was the fault of her? Because she saw the talent? What was the deal? No fault. That's what I'm saying. That's, it's her fault. So the good thing is you had a chance to break in. Yeah. But yeah. not many people get that chance. How does yeah. that break happen with Valerie? Where did you... Who was the introduction? Oh, well, I was trying to um, finish teaching school because um, I told my stepfather, I did it for him. He wanted me to get a real job because he was a musician. He wanted us to have, you know, real employment, not only because... Um, well, just because of things, the way they work for everybody, but for black people, they were even worse. So if you could get an education, finally, now, if you come up north and you, you can get an education, you can probably get some work. You can probably put a roof over your head and have a family and stuff. So really the basic things they wanted for us. And they were musicians, so they knew how, how difficult it was. Oh, man. I, right? <laughs> yep. That's the hardship, you know, because you're going from job to job and sometimes things go dry in between. People don't really understand that when they right. work the regular nine to five, that this is a job of 27 hours a day, a nice harsh <laughs> week. I tell people we don't work. Well, you got to find another job every day. That's <laughs> right. We're working 27 hours a day. Cause even when you're sleeping, you're thinking about what's my next move. What am I going to do? And you have, to, you have no real peace and rest. Right. You're not, you know, when you go work for the man, yeah, you get to check. Yes. We all complain about working the regular nine, but, there's no other job like this in the world either to be no, able to entertain no. people. You know? Well, I'm talking to somebody who knows that. So very often if I'm talking to somebody that's in a, another field or they're not really into entertainment, I don't mind. I describe to them what it, what it is about it that, that draws us to it and that makes us develop ethics if we don't have any. <laughs> not that we're all going to be honest, but you really need, you have a need to do this. There's something about you that needs to do this. You don't just want to do this. You don't, you don't have, you don't like say, well, I could throw, you can't throw this away. <laughs> right. What do you do? It's like, it's like going like this to you, right? Scratch it. So people <laughs> on the outside are going like this to you, but you can go, you can go work at like a, you know, whatever job, uh, let's say at the time, accountant or uh, clerical secretary. And you're saying to yourself, hell no, in your mind, I know you're saying this because you know, in your heart, and your gut saying, this gift that I've been bestowed, I know 
I could share this with the world and it will bring a reward. Oh, no. You said it very sweet and nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They say it oh, no. the street way. No, I never assumed that nobody's going to take this as a gift. I just, I need this. I'm tearing my own clothes off. <laughs> I need this. And so I develop humility. I de develop a sensitivity for other people because I know I can't do this without them. Just a whole series of areas of your personality that you develop. You, you develop courage. You develop strength. <clears throat> you develop a lot of different things that I, I think are different areas of integrity because you, you want to do this so badly. No, but did anybody ever say to you, is, and we all know you're talented, so don't take this the wrong way. Did anybody ever say to you, well, you just don't cut it? Had you ever get in those type of situations? You went to go try out for something or they just said, no, no, no. You just, you're not right for this. No, because you know why? I didn't know where to go to try out most, most of the time. What do you mean? It was always some kind of weird situation. So, like, like for instance, my, my first Broadway show. Well, first of all, I asked my, my stepfather uh, and he and my mother were, were musicians. and they, they worked together. And so they, they, of course, wanted us to get real jobs. So, yeah, right. I keep hearing that real job. What does that mean? Real job. <laughs> well, get an education. Right. Get a job teaching. Everybody in my family has to be a teacher. Well, that was, that was an really, 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 really you would have wanted an education system then in the public school system and been the whole thing, right? Or for the government. Right. Okay. You know, something where you would have a guaranteed pay or um, you get some training. If you're going to be a teacher, then you needed to go probably get a Bachelor of Arts degree at least. Maybe a master's, maybe a doctorate. They wanted to get a real education and have, have uh, um, you know, all the values and everything that, that goes with that. You're not just in the gutter somewhere. You, you have no sense of what civilization is like. They wanted, my mother was from the South, so she wanted to be a Southern lady. Oh, okay. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, a real lady. I, I was always a tomboy, but... <clears throat> I think I've become a lady. <laughs> you had to learn to be like a lady, right? I had to learn that, yes. Because I was brought up, started out on the streets of New York, playing on the streets. Uh, my mother was a single parent. And the, the, the lady that raised me was a sharecropper, an orphan, never learned how to read or write. So she didn't exactly have manners, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So I, I was kind of like that at first. <laughs> But um, what was the question? Well, the question really is, did anything ever come where you did something where you were told a no? Like, you don't fit this. Oh, I was I was going to say, because I think the way things happened for me, I was always in some unusual place where, you know, I should have been auditioning for something or no, no way to go. But it didn't happen like that. And for instance, um, I asked my dad to take me around some different people's um, publishing office, so we did start to meet some people in the industry, and that happened. One of the people I met was Valerie Simpson, but I met her, and we started talking, so she was already in studio backup singing work. We exchanged numbers, so she ushered me into that. Okay. So, did you know how to read music? I said, I teach music, girl. What are you talking about? That's <laughs> right. You didn't even tell her. You didn't even say Bashley. Yeah. You just said, I actually could teach it. No, That's I did because Valerie knows more than I do. Yeah, I know that. She's very talented. Okay. She can well, play the piano and write crazily. I right. Think. She reads. She does everything. She's brilliant. So, no, I, I'm being joke, jokeful. Yeah, no, I know you mean, but you're, you're standing tall. I got it. Yeah. But, no, so we exchanged numbers and everything, and she invited me on. I, I read well, and I'm, I sang by ear, and, you know, so what, whatever we did, we, we had a good time doing it. But on one of the recording sessions, it was um, being performed by uh, Gault McDermott, who was a keyboardist and, and um, composer, but he wrote the music for the Broadway show Hair. So, like, you know, I didn't go audition for it. I didn't know, I wouldn't know where to go. But he came to the studio and recorded us and said, you know, I like all of y'all. If you come down to the um, theater and if you sing for Tom O'Horgan, my director, and you sing for Julie, I don't know, she's our uh, choreographer, I guarantee you a part in the play. But we, we, were, we were auditioning, but we did all the music from here that he wanted to do so they could hear how we sang. But we, right. But it's not a normal audition, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I know, it just happened because you're in the studio and you're actually singing. So, of course, 
I'll speak for myself, me being a producer, talent knows talent. And you're, yeah. you're blown away. He's probably sitting there going, this woman can blow this place away. Like, Not me, all of us. Oh, you know what I mean? In a sense, is that, okay. yeah, so, yeah, so the, the whole group, is this, they sound incredible yeah, together. And they and were they really, out. really, really talented people. They were. And then they come out and they act like, oh, okay, we're good with that. We'll give you a call later. You know, you're like, next thing you probably knew is you guys weren't even auditioning, but can you come down to the theater and try this out on stage, I presume? Well, they offered us to come down and just sing something for the director. Right. And the producer. And you're sitting there. Uh, so um, I'm the only one on the, on the recording session that said, yeah, I'd like to, I, I don't know how to act. I said, you're going to teach and me. That was my next question. Thank you. I was going to ask you, did you have any acting experience? No. Oh, so you just learned on the job. Throw you up on the stage. I, I said, you're going to teach me how to act on the stage? I said, yeah, we think you have interesting personalities. That's yeah. it. Oh, that's, you know what that says to me? The, the gift is inside of you. It just needed to be turned on. Yeah, I mean, you don't know how it's going to happen for you. You know, I, I think normally people would find out where to go to audition and everything. I, I would have too, but the opportunity came like that. So, so from there, let's, you know, I was a kid. I remember the TV sitcom that you were on. How did that happen? Oh, well, uh, let me see. Okay. So we did hair. Right. Then one, one of the girls in, in the, uh, the show, um, hair told me about auditions. For what turned out to be my second Broadway show. Because she reminded me I did not know how to audition. What I should do is start just making the rounds. Just learn how to audition. Learn where the people are and everything. And, uh, you know, maybe get an agent or something. (laughs) Just go get an agent. Find that. Get this. You see, like, okay, you're probably getting this. I mean, really, that's the basis of how you do it. So uh, I auditioned for um, Pearly. Yeah, I'm going to Pearly now. And, and uh, I was just trying to learn how to audition, learn the characters and stuff. But the thing of it is, see, I was raised by a woman who was just like Ludie Bell. So I just mimicked her. Oh, okay. But she was illiterate. She was a maid. She was a share. Well, no, sharecroppers at least kind of run the farm or own the farm. She didn't. She was an orphan. She just she was shuffling from farm to farm, just like Ludie Bell. <laughs> So you're basically reenacting what you saw. Yeah, in my own home. That's my mother was. They say, you, they say you learn what you live. Yeah, my mother was a singer, so she was away all the time. So the lady who raised me, that's the personality I had taken on. Oh, okay. Now we got it. Thank you yeah, for clarifying really that. Explaining it clearly, because that's really the reason why I got the Tony Award. Everybody thought I was acting so great, because if I was lapsed into my New York accent, you don't hear anything that sounds like that, you know? No, because we've been saying that could not sound like no Southern girl. <laughs> so where you sound like, well, let's be real. It sounds like you're from Jersey, Brooklyn. Like, yo, what's up? What you talking? You know? Right. Right. So we all do that when we go away. We, cl- you know, I call it like, it's like clinically cleaning up our accent when we're away. They know we're from New York, but they can't really tell until all of a sudden a bunch of us at a table chit chat. And they're slang. You know, you into your colloquialisms and your slangs and your, your yeah. cultural. So that okay, so you get the you get that in Louis Bell question win the Tony Award and the Clifton Davis show. I remember yeah. that you, as well. You got on there. So is that was that the first television um, thing that happened for you? As that far was as the first one, yes. Because um, what had happened was um, one of the young ladies in the cast of Pearly introduced me to um, Clifton. And he was down the street in the chorus of Hello, Dolly with Pearl Bailey. I mean, it was, it was an incredible time on Broadway. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, not Barbara Streisand, but Pearl Bailey was playing Hello, Dolly. <laughs> yeah, right. Pearl Bailey. <laughs> Which great you want to pick. Okay. But it was just an incredible time, I'm trying to say. And um, we started to date. And then he went on from Hello, Dolly to Two Gentlemen of Verona. So he became a young Broadway star. So uh, <clears throat> CBS came to both of us, not, not at the same time, but eventually both of us, to see if we would co-star with each other on um, a summer replacement show that was being offered to us, actually, by the people of Vogue Carol Burnett. Because <laughs> we were, we were, she was giving us permission to, to replace our show for the summer for six weeks. Okay. 
And that's how that happened. Did you shoot that in New York or California? New York. All right. Yeah. I, that, that awesome show. So I guess now from there, was there any movie spots that you wound up doing or any of that stuff? We did one movie called Lost in the Stars. It was very, very serious um, opera, operetta. I'm trying to think. I can't think of the gentleman's name who, who did it before. Some great opera singer, I think. Black opera singer. That's another thing. You touched opera. You know, a lot of people don't realize that. Like, you, you have the chops with that five octave voice of yours to hit those falsetto parts and those top soprano parts that you hit really high. I've heard it and I'm like, always. <laughs> but meanwhile, like when you're singing, like, you stepped in my life is like way down. You step uh -huh. in my life. <laughs> So happy. So we all we. Like, yeah, right. It just sounds funny to hear you say it that way. Well, in a sense, it's like you know you hear you know you can go way to the tippy top or way way low. To the well, it's not so much that classical is so high. It's a different style of vibrato and just different style of, of voice. Totally different um, vocal style and technique. It's very different. Now, were you trained in that in that area, or you picked that up the classical part? Both. I'm training classical, but it's my natural voice. All the other things I've really learned how to do. So on the other side, so the R&B and all that, the pop, the rock, and the, and even the jazz stuff was basically as you went. Yeah, I've, I've learned it as I go. Well, that's funny because in the, I, I was also classically trained too on the piano. So I understand uh -huh. the basics. But when you start to play jazz chords and things, it's night and day. <laughs> it's very, 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 very oh different. Oh my God, you can't even begin to say, well, you know, you can play a Bach tune and you go play jazz. No, no, it's like, what? No, 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 no. So I'm like really impressed that. But what, what, as you mentioned Bach and you mentioned different styles of, of composers, they each have their own identity. That's yes. how you know the difference between them. But then you know that in terms of contemporary music. It's, it's the same in that sense. But then if you, you take the difference between... Um, uh, say some uh, house music or uh, disco music, totally, or, <laughs> or classical music. Uh, they're like each one deep, different planets. They're very, very, very different from each other. You're right, and uh, because in nowadays they have this thing about genreing the music into like a category, mm -hmm. and a lot of times they subgenre it too much. You know, it's a style. Like disco was a 4-4 beat sound. Yes, there was the Philly international sound. There was more of the European sound, which is more stringy sounding and stuff. Right. And now they take I'm just stopping stop you because you said stringy. You didn't say classical. There's a difference. Well, the classical too, yeah. There's a classical sound too of it as well. But yeah. um, thank you. Um, and But now, so you take four categories, five different parts of it. And they, they make 10 subcategories to each one. So you're sitting there going, well, wait a minute. It's all, it is what it is. It's still disco or it's still house music or it is jazz, you know, whatever that particular genre is. But, you know, everybody has a way of pigeonholing a thing now that has to be in a box. Oh, well, I, I, I think that's always going to be because um, I guess you're always thinking in terms of introducing people or having people find what they want. So you have to categorize, I think. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess I used to think don't categorize because I, I because I was finding myself. I didn't think had nobody else had found me, so I don't want you to put me in any category. But I I think you kind of have to. Maybe not so much sub like you're saying because it, that makes it confusing. That's right. So now I'm going to say, of course, in the seventies, we all come to love you. Now here's the question: Did you have a mapped out formula? For what you wanted to achieve in the 1980s. Huh? <laughs> in other words, did you have an idea? You know, we were watching you as, as a recording artist in the 70s. And you know all these great songs. In the 80s, you, the, the sound oh. changed and oh. things changed. Did you have... Really like happened. You get people who really are um, uh, experts in these areas. <clears throat> That's why you have a good manager. You hope you do. Not everybody does. You hope. I, I had some good ones. Yeah, and I know that. You Helping did. me carve out what my career was going to be. And, and not only allow, allowing me to say what I wanted or what I was trying to do, but try to help show me what I sounded like to other people. 
And then, of course, you have the um, the record executives help you do that because no matter what you think, they have to sell it to somebody else that you don't even know. So it's a community affair of, of experts in these in these areas. Did you always agree with everyone to the decisions that were being made, or did you stand knowing that you had a better way of doing it? No, I never had a better way. I'm, I'm always been like a student because, first of all. My natural voice is classical. So anything else was not really natural for me. So I had to discover really what is natural for me. And of course, I want to sing like Aretha Franklin. (laughs) Right, because everybody's always, we all do this. We muse to who our our legends are in our mind. We want to be in our hearts. Yeah. Our hearts, our minds. I could see that. Aretha Franklin would be, of course. Of course. So I take her, for, for an example, I take her song, Lean On Me. And uh, <clears throat> I just sing it and sing it and sing it and sing it. And I develop, I'm a musician, so I develop an arrangement that suits my voice. And it starts to work. And then I see from that, I can tell now by looking back, this is how I developed my range and my style, where I was going to go here and, where, and how I developed um, kind of a road map. But no, I didn't have a general idea. I just I want to be famous like everybody else, you know. <laughs> All right, right. that but one. See, you know? See, but, you, but you know, it's nice he said it because people think you're looking in the crystal ball and you're going, "I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this and I'm going to." And it's sometimes but you know we we all think that. And then what happens? Well, we start to try to do it, and it just has it's like you're on another planet. Not, nothing works like that. And then right. you say, "Oh my God, am I? Go- uh, it's not going to happen for me." And something happens to say, well, just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. Now, in the 80s, when this whole thing was exploding for you, okay, because I'm going to look at talk more on a pop level. Okay. Okay. MTV begins and the videos begin. How do you break into that? What's the, what's the, the road that gets you into that? You know, let's talk about like Madonna, because you, you know, you're, you're there before everyone begins to have that explosion. Even Michael Jackson with um, Thriller and all that stuff. Yeah, but so, I'm older than Michael. I know that. That's <laughs> I know that. But that's why I'm But I'm also trying to be kind, too. I don't want to date you either, you know, in a sense. Um, but these things are brand new. How do they get you into that music, into that genre? Well, that's what you have a team for. You have a manager. You, you, you have your record company. You have all the A&R people around there looking at what other people are doing and trying to figure out and meeting and talking and, and um, suggesting songs and songwriters and, and, and video concepts. Somebody submitting all of these. You know, but I'm glad you say that, Mel, because some people think the generation of now and with the internet, oh, I'm a one man operation. I can do everything. I can be the record label. I could be the, the singer. And it, I, I personally feel it doesn't work without having outside people around you i think well i need outside people i could never really i know now i could never see myself i had the dream i had the the courage i had a lot of things but i don't think i really look have any any idea what i look like that's important you're the packaging who's the and style, happens, who's style you right who's going to be a stylist who's going to see what the beautiful well, I, I'm not even getting to a stylist yet. I mean, just are you going to look like you, you combed your hair and woke up this morning? And you know, what what are you supposed to look like? Just the basic. Let's let's say you're not going to be styled for a film. Let's, you're just going to take go take a meeting. What are you saying? You know. So I, I've had help with all of that. Is all I'm saying. But the thing is, you're always selling yourself, no matter what you're doing, because you're well, you're the product, right? Yeah. And people, that's the thing about when we say music business, movie business, show business. Yeah. The word business means you have to constantly put yourself forward and always have your best ready. Am I right? I agree. I I, I mean, I want to. I do. Yeah. I, I mean, I do that now. And now that I know, I mean, I've, I've known for a long time, but it's a lot. I'll, I'll just say that. And, and it's every aspect of you because... Um, I don't know, just because it is, but I mean, I could give you a lot of reasons why it is, 
but you are the product, your whole, your, your mind, your attitude, the way you look, um, your perspective, your philosophy, your religion, everything. You're the package. And you better be ready. What's the greatest performance of your career? Would you say the one of the or one of the greatest performances? I would definitely say the Metropolitan Opera House. I definitely give you that. That's an unusual and rare, and um, it was. I wasn't on the bill. With, I was on the bill with uh, um, George Faison. and he had a dance troupe because I met him at, in Pearly and did it afterwards. And so it was essentially my and our team's concept of, of what it was going to be. Beautiful. Can you share some wisdom or advice to some of the younger people coming up in this business? Like, you know, some tips, what they should well, do? I'm not sure, but you, you just mentioned something that um, we can all feel like we can be a one-man band now. I feel like even if that's the case, you should grab a little team around you and consult with other people, not just yourself. Yeah. And That's it's like one thing, because whatever perspective you have, it cannot be from the person looking at you. So you, you need more than one perspective. If you could have done anything differently or done over, would you, would you, do you have any regrets on that? Not regrets, but I, I would have known that I was going to be a musician. I would have gone to a music school. I was studied performing from um, time I was 10 years old on up because that's what I'm going to be. So why should I look at anything else? Maybe it's probably better that I didn't do that because I have a maybe an empathetic view of other people and what their circumstances are. And, and it wouldn't just be all, be all about me, but probably if I could have done what I wanted to, I would have done nothing but music. I would have stayed in performing. I would never see any other part of life because I love it so much, but I don't think that's a good thing to do. But you said that I have any real regrets from anything. Uh, yeah, I, I felt like in some cases I wasted a lot of time. Um, of course, like all human beings, I made a lot of mistakes. I wouldn't have made those mistakes. I would have gone straight to my mark and, you know, I wouldn't have hurt people and I wouldn't have got hurt. Right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But you know what? What doesn't, I guess what doesn't take you out makes you stronger. You know, all these It definitely things. does. I mean, if you want to take it the right way and if something so bad hasn't happened to you that you're, you know, absolutely disabled or something, you, you have another chance. And, you, you know, you've been showing that, you know, you're everlasting in a sense because, you know, to keep doing this and keep this momentum going and have still that, you know, that drive is an incredible thing. You know, it, it, we don't ever see you. Let's put it like this. We don't ever see you becoming the bitty, mini old granny. You know <laughs> I mean, that's not something I could see happen well, to you. Not yet. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? We're, I don't think you're there yet. I still think you still have what they say, something more to say. Okay. You know, with your, you know, with your music and stuff. Um, you know, here's something I thought about. What, what steered you into working in the gospel music side of the business? God. <laughs> So what happened? One day he knocked on your door and said, I'm here? Yeah. Because uh, uh, I think a series of other things had fallen away and fallen apart, as, as far, especially as far as what my music was concerned, whatever my spirituality was and my, my religion was, it didn't seem to have any structure. I mean, I, I've been raised in the church and all that, but I didn't seem to have a um, point of view or, or uh, a belief of my own, personal. Okay. So I pursued that, and uh, um, uh, I got baptized again, uh, born again again, and um, I came back to the Catholic Church. I, I did a lot of research, but I realized that's the church that Jesus started, so it can't be wrong. It's got to be right. Even if people are wrong, it's not wrong. That's the problem. You know, the people run it, and sometimes we forget the actual real message sometimes, you know, in, in, in the translation. But you're right. You have to find it. It finds you, and then you make it part of your way of life. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically what's happened. And out of that, um, I've been able to do whenever I have time to do some some uh, sacred songs. Um, of course, gospel is a certain type of genre, and, and I like to do that too. But I like to be able to just do sacred things. If but girl, not. you have that voice for it. It's not like you can't. Do I do it. now. I bet you. I've, I've developed. Lord. 
gave you that voice that can kick some yeah. behinds. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, Melba's screaming at you. Fine, God. <laughs> here's here's one. Um, you know, I know we're pushing this Imagine album. I wanted to. Be, can you share with us about the album, of course, and how your daughter played a big part in this? Because I know your daughter's involved as well. Yeah, matter of fact, it's going to be on her label. Let me show you, baby. The Gallery Records. Yeah, okay. Gallery. Yes. Oh, well, Gallery Entertainment, she calls it. Gallery Entertainment. Okay. She wants to be a uh, multi entertainment, not just records. Okay. Congratulations. The Chinese Imagine. And uh, it's a series of songs that are just beautiful, beautiful songs. But when they're strung together, they have a kind of a spirituality about them that just says, um, uh, Imagine the Peace was on every street. <laughs> Oh, gee. And um, there's uh, another song called So in Love that's so romantic and so beautiful. The whisper of your name melts every tear away. Uh, it's just, just um, soft and beautiful, but they have energy. Right. And um, they're very, very contemporary. And <clears throat> they're beautiful songs, but they're not songs that if I just listened to them, I would have thought they were for me. Because they know high notes. Well, there are. There's some high notes. But it's, it's not so abundantly full of those like I would normally do. It just has a different um, mellower feel. And more, um, some of the songs are, are what we might call step tempo. Yep. Just kind of moderate tempo. Not so much drive like I always give. I'll, I'll get back to the drive, but this one's a little bit more mellow. Yeah, this is, no, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a really nice, it's a really well put together album. It's very, I mean, I'm, I like your driving stuff, of course. Like you said, the drive, the more exciting Melba Moore. But yes. this is also shows another side to you, which is, re it was really nice when I listened to a streaming. I was like, this is really, really nice. It's like very, it's like contemporary. Yep. Put it easy, easy yep. music. Nice mm -hmm. contemporary, easy music. Everyone, check this out. Miss Melba Moore received two presidential awards. <laughs> right, not one, two. <laughs> check this out. Not one, but two awards. <laughs> one from Joseph R. Biden Award and a Volunteer Service Award. Yeah. Here's the only question of it. What is that feeling like to be presented with these awards for your life? The only word I can use is amazing because I see the company that I'm in. The people that have done courageous things and people who really devote their lives to volunteerism and and people who have made courageous achievements and I'm counted in the number. I'm I'm in awe. We're in awe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for us, some of us, it's like, hey, we won a Grammy or an award or a Sony award or whatever. But to hear two presidential awards. That's yo. That's incredible. There's no other well, way. I, I think I, I know it's 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 not unreal or anything because I am a volunteer. I, anytime I have a, a moment of time to give somebody, I do it because I know God's going to give it back to me, and that's how you get such a rich life. You give to other people, and so um, I know I do volunteer, but I I just didn't, didn't think anybody's going to pay that kind of attention to it. <laughs> well. And now here's the other one, guys and gals, and children of dance, music, and opera, and everything else. And so she receives news that she's being honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. What was that experience like? Come on now. That's like that. Me? <laughs> yeah, right. That stems up your life in the music. That's the first thing. Me with those who are going to be on the, on the Hollywood Walk of Fame? Me too? First, but then... <clears throat> I realized the process had been going on for quite a couple of years and that this this it's um, quite an in-depth process and quite an expensive process. So a lot of people came together to make sure that I had this habit. It wasn't just me. So I'm going to have a lot of people to say thank you to and to live up to. And after that star gets there, I better be a star. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be there long after we're all gone for eternity. Yeah. yeah. That's, that, that's it's pretty amazing. You know, it's hard to sometimes gather that, you know, I get to talk to such wonderful people like yourselves that have such a rich history in our music industry and, of course, stage and screen, all that you've done. But, you know, to hear it 
to read it. And when I read the two presidential awards, I said, ooh la la. And then I went, damn, Tony. <laughs> yeah, we know that. Yep. Great actress. The woman can act her, her butt off. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. And she's still spunky. I saw your shows. There, you're like a firecracker on stage. You just got energy for days. God bless you. I want to know where this energy is harnessed because I like to borrow some of it when I'm <laughs> at, when I'm out DJing like that. Or we're going from city to city, and you're tired yeah. in between. I'm like, girl, you're still you're doing it, and I'm going. Where are you going to take this? Where do you see this from now to the end of your career, or to the end? Like as I hate to say, it, to the end of our existence where do you, you are you just going to keep going so you can't do it no more is there or is no there I'm, I'm going to continue to get new team members here so that i can really get out of it what i'm putting into it so a, a lot of times um i'm kept going and i did it and i loved it but i really didn't have a team to take advantage of the things that that i've been doing but all of that's starting to happen now so that i can stop doing some things and just go on up upwards to other things and produce things and, you know, bring other people through now and not be so hard um, working at just doing my style and my thing and my, uh, my realm. Gotcha. And help some other people better. I think. No, it makes total sense. And of course, before I let you go, how are your tour dates looking for this 23? Oh, real good. No, everything is coming up real nice. Yeah, it's um, good, right? To be loved again and be stage to stage, it feels it's it's a great feeling still. Oh no, it's wonderful. I'm just gonna make sure that I don't overdo myself because you can you can overwork yourself. I'm, I'm not gonna do that. But just try to uh continue to gather team players here because everything is structured slightly differently now. But um there's lots of wonderfully talented people that are helping help me continue to finish finish up. I started it already. You probably um uh, talked to Kevin and, and Angelo. Yes. And uh, my, my daughter's part of the team, and she's bringing several, several people uh, aboard to take care of that aspect of it, the merchandising and the, uh, um, the, the, the music aspect of it, and um, bring new players into that team so that we can not only continue to make re recordings for me if I feel like it, but we can open the way for other, other new, new artists. Okay, so good. She wants to, to, to uh, manage uh, new artists. Okay. That's a so great. we're paving the way for the future. We hope. We hope. Oh, I think you already started. You know, this is a new direction for you. Yeah. Um, with some of the old technology, and then you modified it, morphed it into today's social media skills. Because I'm watching you on social media. You're very you're constantly um, posting things, and I said, right. "Good on it." You know, yeah. a lot of our of our. Let's just say the older gang, they don't believe in the social media. They're fighting. This is Main Street. There's nowhere else to go. Right. What if you don't go there, you ain't going. <laughs> That's right. I tell them, if you don't get on it, talk on it, you're going to be left behind. No, we can't have that. <laughs> well, I know you have another interview. I want to thank you so much for spending your time with us. <laughs> and please do not stop what you do. Thank you. Um, one last thing. Mm -hmm. Are you now writing your own songs for stuff that you're working on? Or you are you letting No, I have on? lots and lots and lots of songwriters because I want them to be as good at songwriting as I am as interpreting. Aha. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I thought I wanted to write a long time ago, but it takes a lot of talent, it takes a lot of focus. And um, if I'm gonna do all these other things, I don't think I could give the time to it. I'm not sure I would be a great songwriter, but I want great songwriters. And I got some. Right. So you want to basically hear that demo with the rough idea on and go, that works for me. Yeah. That doesn't work for me. Eh. Yeah. Because they're there. That's their talent. This is mine. When we put them together. We got a team. And a win. And, and a win. Yes. Because I always believed and Tom Moulton always said that it's not about us winning. It's about the record winning. In other words, right. that thing's over and it's, and you play it back. Right. Is it going right. to but I think I'm, I'm making a good choice because people think I'm I'm writing the songs because they're so well suited for me. Right, and that's what I that's why I was asking to make sure: mm -hmm. Are you in any of the writing of it? Because sometimes that mm -hmm. happens, and you could be starting the writing, and then you know you have associates around you also laying out the song lyrics and stuff, or you come up with the melodies. But I see in your case, it makes total sense. But again, I see now how well you you pick the records that really suit you. 
So <laughs> once again, congratulations. Can I talk about that too? Because I realized we change over time and uh, things change over time and whatever was fabulous yesterday, at least check it to see if it's still okay today. <laughs> That's right. So congratulations on almost more than six decades of you being in this damn business. <laughs> you. And I say damn business because we all know one minute you're the superstar, next minute you feel like, oh, and then next thing comes out of nowhere, you are on top again or whatever. Or we have to ride out the storms, like they say. Right. Nice. So everyone, thank you for tuning in to True Ass Stories, the iconic Melba Moore, who we all love and adore. <laughs> doing what you're doing, my friend. Uh, and me too. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Stay right where you are so I can be with you next time. Yes. All right. Thank you. For